So today's seminar, we may go a little bit uh, different on the time breakdowns than what Maria put out, but I will try to incorporate two breaks. Um, so design of structural glass, there is another webinar that I've given for SK Ghosh um, Associates that goes through more of the theory um, and kind of background and behavior of how glass behaves as a structural material. This webinar um, is intended to, to go to dig a little bit deeper into how we actually design um, structural glass elements. Um, despite that, in order to go through those examples and, and ensure that everybody has a good understanding of how the examples work, I do need to spend a little bit of time going through the basic mechanics um, of glass as, as a material um, because those, those backgrounds and mechanics explain why um, the various codes that are out there uh, work the way that they do. Um, so this is just a brief outline of what we'll get through today. We're going to do a review of basic glass mechanics, um, glass production, failure mechanisms, and then the basic um, types of glass. Then we'll go through glass design per ASTM E1300. Um, we are, I mean, glass for a variety of reasons is a unique material. Um, one of the many reasons it is unique here in the United States, there is not currently a code um, that governs design of structural glass once you are beyond typical pane applications. Um, but there are ways that we can kind of use um, E1300 to help guide us in that direction. And then I will provide some resources um, for other, uh, other sources. Um, I'm not going to get too heavy into structural glass elements because of the lack of design guidelines. Um, I'm going to provide some general outlines and then point towards other resources and then kind of leave it in your um, hands as engineers if you would like to, to go that route to do a little bit more research. I will go over through pro a few programs um, that, that can be beneficial and then uh, talk about some of the forthcoming guidelines that are in the works for structural glass. So first, what is glass? Um, if we take a look at quartz, um, which is a, a silicon dioxide, a crystalline material, um, and then we convert, uh, we go from quartz um, to silica glass, which instead of that tense, intense um, silica structure, it's got a little bit more of an amorphous structure. I'm sorry, instead of the intense crystalline structure, it's got a bit more of an amorphous structure. Um, and silica glass um, was, was then turned into soda lime glass through the inclusion of sodium. Um, ions, which reduce the melting temperature and allow glass to be more workable um, as a, as a, when it is heated up um, as, a, as a workable material. Um, and that is what we see in production today. And what glass in your windows is made of is effectively soda lime silica glass. So the glass production process, um, when glass is produced in, and glass was first produced in, in kind of the mid or early part of, um, of uh, the kind of this era has been produced in the Middle East for hundreds upon hundreds of years. If we take a collection of all the various um, materials that we're going to turn into glass, silicon dioxide, um, sodium, uh, disodium oxide, a number of other things that I have uh, kind of listed up here. I'm not going to go through all of the chemistry. If we heat all of those materials up um, in uh, a big vat effectively, and this is what a modern um, float glass production line would look like. This, this methodology was developed in 1959 by the Pilkington brothers. So if we take all of our raw materials, heat them up, um, and then those materials are pulled out, are poured out onto a float line. Um, and that float line consists of some type of molten material. It's often molten tin. Sometimes there can be other elements um, in there. And the glass, the heated glass material, floats up on top of that. Um, so we have a more dense material um, that forms the base glass, floats on the top. The glass will come to kind of a natural thickness. So when we first um, pour that molten glass out onto the molten tin, um, it will float to uh, some type of uniform thickness. That material can then be um, kind of pushed out or in um, to change the overall thickness. And then when the glass comes off the line and cools down, that is how we end up in glass um, with with form glass off of a float line. And float lines can produce um, large quantities of glass uh, on any given day. But this process where glass is floating, where there is an air side, a side of the glass that's above the tin and a side of the glass that is on tin or on another material is important for um, how glass behaves as a material. So just some typical sizes um, from that you're getting directly off of a production line. Typical thicknesses range from uh, about 2 millimeters up to 25 millimeters, although anything below, I mean, 2, 3, and 4, and then 
what, what we typically see is in the range of 5 to 12. And beyond that is a bit more atypical. Um, I will apologize in advance. Much of this presentation switches between metric um, and imperial units. Glass design in many cases, uh, even in the United States, is still often doesn't done uh, in metric, um, although we do see imperial a little bit more frequently. 